Hello all, Old Geek again, and here's my uh, second, or third if you class my Lost City one, video on the line of basic modules. I didn't spend too much time with basic, I dipped back into it occasionally, but I spent most of my teenage years playing AD&D. And I've already done more thorough reviews on the two modules that I've run or played most extensively. I've dipped into a few of the others, but don't really think I've delved into them enough to give them thorough and fair reviews, apart from maybe B1 and B2. But most of my viewers have used them much more extensively than I have, as I didn't acquire either when I started playing. Both were relatively late additions to my collection, so I share none of the nostalgia that you lot have for them. There are 14 in total on the list. 15 if you include um, Blizzard Pass, which was M1, became M Solo 1, but was a basic adventure. And I have also included B1 to 9, In Search of the in Search of Adventure, a compilation. So plenty to get through. Let's get started. In 14th place, B9, Castle Caldwell and Beyond. This collection of five short adventures was one of the laziest products that TSR ever came up with. And so embarrassing that even the author's name was a joke. Harry Knuckles. And the puns in the adventure are just as bad. One riddle about being a goose. This one is a worthy challenger to the Forest Oracle for the title of D&D's biggest turd. For a wonderfully sarcastic review with a lot more detail, check out uh, the review on Prince of Nothing's blog. It's very good. In 13th place, B1 to 9, In Search of Adventure. Who doesn't love low effort module collections with nine butchered versions of other modules crudely linked together Plus it contains some of B9, which only drags it down further. It was pathetic, cynical and desperate. In 12th place, B8, Journey to the Rock. A slightly arbitrary 12th, because I don't really know very much about it. But it has a dull title. The cover art was probably Larry Elmore's least interesting piece, and the few reviews I've read were not exactly complimentary. It's not really compelling, so by default, it gets 12th spot. In 8th place, yes, 8th, because we have a big tie here, for five modules if you include Blizzard Pass, so these occupy 8th, 9th, 10th and 11th, or maybe 12th as well. B7, Rahasia. B11, King's Festival. B12, Queen's Harvest. And B Solo, Ghost of Lion Castle. I've never owned any of these, never played them, never read them. And that, by default, makes them better than the ones I've listed so far. As I said, I could put Blizzard Pass in with these because it was a basic module but it had an M1 or M Sol 1 designation because it was rebadged. So into the ones I actually do know a little bit about. Apart from Castle Caldwell and Beyond I do unfortunately know a fair bit about that and yeah yeah it deserves to be last. Seventh place B3 Palace of the Silver Princess. Gene Wells didn't get the memo. Errol Otis committed shenanigans with the art and poor old Tom Moldvay was left to pick up the pieces. I posted my full review of this one yesterday and some of you told me off for it. Don't matter. <laughs> Check that video out if you want to know more about what I think about this one. But yep, seventh place for B3. Sixth place, B5. Horror on the Hill. A position based on one partial playthrough. But one I enjoyed. Though our party of three first and second level PCs never stood a chance. We enjoyed what 
we played. And our DM also thought highly of it and did a decent job of running it. Maybe I'll read it myself and, and run it one day. In which case it might move up or down this list. But for now, it's fine at number six. Fifth place. B6, The Veiled Society. I played this in the 1980s as a spotty teen and I loved it, thoroughly enjoyed it. It didn't matter to me at that time that it's very linear and very short and it had some useless fold-out cardboardy buildings that we didn't use because we played Theatre of the Mind. It was something different. An adventure set in a city, there weren't many of those, with politics and intrigue weren't many of those in the, in the basic line. Well, politics and intrigue of sorts. It was a quite basic. It was a lot of fun. Again, though, if I was to read it now, eh, it might move a place or two in the list. Probably down a place or two. But my memories of it are fuzzy and nice. So I'm giving it fifth place. Fourth place. Don't shoot me for this one. Please. B2. The Keep on the Borderlands. Look, I get why people love B2. I really do. It's a pure sandbox. They got a copy of it with their first ever D&D box set. So, nostalgia. I didn't. So I'm all pouty and jealous about that. In all seriousness, it's never really grabbed me. I respect it for what it offers in terms of a setting, potentially months and months of play, and a neat framework on which a DM can expand and develop. But as I've said in other videos, I'd rather use T1, the village of Homlet, for that purpose, because to me it had more life in it. Third place. B1. In search of the unknown. The other module that lots of you got your first D&D set and I didn't. B1 for me edges B2 because of the imagination and the quality of the descriptions. It too is a framework for the DM to develop, to fill with monsters and scatter with treasures. It has no plot really to speak of and the map doesn't make a great deal of sense but it's a source of so many of those iconic dungeoneering tropes, especially that room with the magic pools. It's simple, honest, old school dungeon crawling, a teaching tool for the novice DM and lasting inspiration for those of us who are a bit older and creakier. Second place goes to B10. Night's Dark Terror. A heady position for this monster of a module, especially as I'm basing my opinion on it on simply reading it. I've never run it, and I've never played it. But reading through it, it just looks awesome. I imagine that if or when I do actually uh, enjoy a game of it, it'll force me to push it up to number one. While TSR spent the mid-1980s smelling their own farts and those of Tracy Hickman, Graham Morris and TSR UK kept things honest and came up with some glorious products. And B10 might just be the pinnacle of those. It's certainly up there with UK3 and UK4, which were both also outstanding. It was a stepping stone between basic and expert D&D. And this adventure was twice the size of the other B modules in the series in terms of pure page count. And it dwarfed them yet further in terms of actual content. It packed so much into those pages. It was an epic quest. It was a mass battle, immense variety, a perfect blend of all the traditional pillars of play. There was tons of new stuff in there, new monsters, all sorts, and even scope for further expansion. It didn't need it, but that was there anyway. Sadly, 
it commands a suitably beefy price tag on eBay nowadays. Oh well. So, at number one. Well, it's the only one I've not mentioned so far. So you know what's coming. And I reviewed the Goodman Games version of it a week or two ago. B4, The Lost City. This is a masterpiece. So go and check out my Goodman, my review of the Goodman Games version in a few minutes when you've finished up this video off. The Lost City is everything I want from a D&D adventure. Lovingly crafted. Smartly packaged. There's oodles of freedom. A tense and satisfying dungeon crawl. And it drips inspiration from every pore. It has so much scope in those 32 pages. It's insane. It's not just the base, best basic module, in my opinion. It's right up there alongside the best module ever produced. It might not be the outright best, but it's got a shot at being it. It's superb. Absolutely brilliant. So there you go. My breakdown of the basic series of adventures. I guess I'm going to have to move on to Expert D&D next. But until then, see ya. And this was the first video I've ever recorded. First review video in a single take.